Okay, hello everyone. I'm uh, Francesca Fedeli from uh, Fight the Stroke Foundation. I'm here today with uh, Laura and Agnes, so, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> thank you. You're, you're welcome and also thank you for, for coming here. Uh, I was anticipating that uh, we are not so used to have international guests. So I'm, I'm more than happy today to celebrate with you uh, the forthcoming day, which is the World CP Day on the 6th of uh, October. And uh, we are also going to put this in video interview within our channel, which is called Fight the Virus. It was born uh, a few years ago. It, it is a chance for us uh, to have online chat uh, with experts and somehow you are experts because you are people with CP, so you know better than me for sure what does it mean uh, living with CP. Also, this uh, interview is within the context of uh, meet and code uh, events, uh, so it's about technology. We would like uh, to understand together with you how technology can help to overcome barriers. So we know that disability is not uh, about the person itself, but it's about the context. Uh, so how technology could be supportive uh, in uh, overcome these uh, contextual uh, barriers. So first of all, I would like uh, to ask uh, to each of you to introduce yourself. So I, I see first Laura, so I will ask to, to Laura. Laura, just introduce yourself. So apart from the fact that you are Italian, please <laughs> tell to the Italian people who you are, what do you do in your whole life? Uh, so, I am Italian, but I live in Belgium, here in Brussels. Um, I can say in a sunny Brussels day. It's just so strange in this period, but by the way. And I am 38 years old. I have CP. Uh, so, it means that I was born very, very early, at 28 weeks of pregnancy. And then I got the virus. And so, uh, it means that my brains had um an injury caused by this virus and so i have what is called tetraplegia spastic tetraplegia it means that uh, i have all my limbs with spasticity um and uh, but it it didn't allow me to have a quite of so normal life um, and actually, let, let me say, Laura, that I met you, so uh, you're a bit strange uh, case of uh, tetraplegia because you are walking, uh, you're traveling. <laughs> yeah, and, and I live abroad. You so. live abroad. <laughs> so. Yeah, and, uh, and moreover, uh, I am a mother with CP. Uh, and it, it means that a person with CP can do whatever. Uh, but you must believe in yourself and you must believe in your strength. Because what CP uh, teach to me is that my abilities are stronger than my disability. Thank you, Laura. Very, very clear message <laughs> and explanation. Agnes, we are coming to you. Yeah. So just tell us. Yeah. Hi, I'm Agnes. I'm from Slovenia. Uh, I'm from Maribor, exactly. That is the second largest city in Slovenia, next to Ljubljana. Uh, I'm a 28-year-old, uh, currently living at home still with my parents and my grandparents, or my grandmother, so to say. Um, otherwise, I'm a translator, I'm a PhD candidate, uh, I'm a language editor, so I do everything with a language that is connected uh, to How language many languages, to, Agnes? Uh, speak? Currently just English and Slovene, but I'm planning to expand this knowledge to other <laughs> possible uh, languages, maybe even in, at Italian in the future. Um, I have also CP. I was born with CP. Um, also prematurely as Laura, um, because I didn't get enough nutrition while I was in my mother's womb. And this resulted in me being, um, let's say in late terms, very hungry when I was born. 
uh, and so I needed an extra care and uh, extra attention from the day one. So that the consequence of that is that I cannot walk. I use an electric wheel wheelchair most of the time. Although I can walk, but with the support of another person, another person holding me. Um, beside that, I am not as spastic as I could be, and I'm so grateful for that. Uh, I have high muscle tonus, that is kind of the other, um, the other field of cerebral palsy. Uh, but other than my motor function and my uh, sometimes my physical strength, everything else is in perfect order, in, including speech and other abilities. So I'm grateful and, for that. And, and we can realize it. And also yes. yeah. we can see that uh, CP doesn't prevent you yeah. to hold a PhD, yeah. to study, um, to travel again. So I always, I always yeah. joke that me and my CP are in a long term relationship. That is, uh, till the day I die, or we die together. Uh, exactly. Because we have bad days, good days, we communicate between each other. Sometimes we get a little angry, sometimes we get a little depressed, but overall we are fine. We are on good terms most of the time. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Uh, I just noticed that both of you mentioned spasticity, so it looks like it'd be something uh, very that happens often uh, in people with, uh, with CP. And we are also talking to parents, to mothers, to fathers, and they uh, often ask to us, uh, how does it feel to uh, have uh, spasticity? So it's something like uh, a pain in the muscles or something that uh, prevents you to have a smooth movements. Uh, would you like to explain? Because it's something that probably I would like to know and in order to better help their sons and their daughters. So for, for, for what can sound me, uh, me, I don't have any particular pain. So uh, then when I am very tired, so it can arrive that I have some pain, but you can touch me. So touching is not painful. <laughs> and um, so the positive side is that you are more and more strong than a normal person. So it means that I really can hang wherever. Uh, I can hang uh, with my arms. Uh, by myself uh, I, I can i have maybe i am stronger and stronger but on the opposite side yeah sometimes i have involuntary move movement um mostly at night when i sleep uh, or uh, when i'm falling to sleep um and so watch when... out uh, to the person who's sleeping next to you <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and and also if I am in danger or I feel to be in danger, uh, so as a, I feel myself uh, like a, a butterfly because I move my arms uh, like a butterfly where I feel myself in danger, and it's something typical for people with spasticity. Um, or another uh, involuntary movement is when I feel myself uh, a little bit stressed or um, uh, or in love or uh, stressed by something or some event. And, and like so you, you lower you, the barriers yeah. and then uh, specific <laughs> comes up. Yeah, uh, and, and you can see it's, 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 um, it's very easy to see because my, my legs uh, starts to move uh, without any sense. <laughs> but by the way, I think that is uh, a characteristic of my personality. It means like I cannot hit uh, my feelings. And from one hand, I think it's very, very positive because you, have, you are very free to, to show your personality and your feelings. On the other hand, sometimes could be a little bit uh, um, uh, strange for the people who surround you and starting to look at 
uh, at you as a strange person, but it's not. <laughs> I can reassure all of you. I just met uh, both Laura and Agnes, <laughs> so <laughs> don't be scary, madam. <laughs> um, Agnes, any, any so, feedback on this? Yeah, so for me, the, spe the specificity is actually quite similar to Laura's, except that I do have occasionally some muscle cramps, especially when I exercise a lot or when I do uh, some quick movements or when I'm I'm tired, for example. Uh, last night I just returned from Brussels and uh, I had to take my medication for uh, muscle re relaxation so that I, I could sleep well because otherwise I would be completely uh, devastated in the morning the and I wouldn't, and... I wouldn't be able to get up because of, uh, because of the tiredness of my muscles. Uh, maybe I have a little more, I mean, sometimes I notice that I I do get tired more quicker or quicker than I used to when I was younger. Uh, and sometimes my muscles feel stiff. So it's like I would I would have a metal inside of my body or a lid or anything like that. So something very heavy. And when this happens, I usually have to go and exercise because that's the only thing that that helps me to prevent uh, this feeling. Like uh, muscle relaxation. Yeah, muscle relaxation and uh, I exercise um, based on a special method called Bobot method. Yeah. Uh, that these are the repetitive movements that you do with your therapist together yeah. uh, so that your brain can recognize the correct movement pattern and they somehow internalize it so you become more aware of your aware. movement of your muscle of your muscles of your um of your bone structure of everything in your body and that is something very useful thank you yeah. thank you for this, From my uh, side, if yeah. i can add something yeah sure just to explain what cp could be yeah. from my side um i have uh, a double hemiplegia it means that left side is different than that right side Mm -hmm. And um, doing sport, because I was a Paralympic athlete before, in my previous life, I can say, uh, I learned something very useful for uh, lifelong, because uh, I have left side that is uh, less spastic than the, the right side. So uh, I tried all, all the time to learn a new movement on the left side, to just to understand the movement itself to pass the same movement day by day on the right side and in this in this way year by year i started to use muscles that was hidden to me or better to my mind this was coming up to to my mind as a mother so which was according to you the age in which both of you just uh, realized the how to feel your body, how to take advantage of the strength and of the weakness of your body. It was a specific age when, when you start realizing, like when you were teenagers or? Uh, for me, it happened just recently when I got a really good physiotherapist uh, <laughs> who, who could show me how to. Who told I mean, how to. I was a, I was aware of it before because I had a really good physiotherapist even when I was a child. Child, but um, my I I wasn't so willing to do anything on my own. And that when I saw that I can actually do a lot with my body without the help of anybody else, I just took it and learned how. I'm still learning how to use my body to the max. So, yeah. But I like this uh, self-consciousness. On uh, yeah, that's a self-awareness, physical self-awareness. I would say. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so oh, go, go Laura. Yeah, sorry. Fr oh, from go. my side, being as yeah. a teenager with 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 CP was uh, a little bit difficult because of the representation of the female body that was so totally different than my body because and. Yeah, I could not you, t tell the people that you spent uh, the most of your life in Rome, in Italy. So you yeah, just yeah, recently yeah. I, moved. I moved to Belgium five years ago. Uh, so 
Um, I spent the rest of my life in Italy, uh, apart from studies. Uh, and uh, and so uh, for me, being a teenager with CP was very, very difficult because my body was totally um, different from the other one. And for the models that mm, uh, publicity and shows uh, suggest us, um, I think think about the society at the end of 90s, uh, beginning to, uh, 2000, uh, it was totally different and body shaming did, uh, didn't exist like uh, nowadays or, or better, the perception of body shaming and the body positive was something that uh, was unclear but it was very clear to me because uh, I had to fight against myself and against the society to impose my own model of my, my, my body. And for that, in 2015, um, I shared on Facebook my, my photo with in bikini at the end of the summer, just to show that my body is my body, uh, not because I am proud of that, but I'm not scared or 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 ashamed of that. Uh, it it's a part of me, and it was so strange because my picture uh, was shared a thousand and thousand times, uh, and newspapers from all around the world wrote about my my picture on Facebook, and I didn't understand the reason for which it was very very popular. Then I wrote an article that described my picture. Uh, in La Repubblica, and it was written that it was the first time that a disabled people shared her own body on the social network. And this was uh, uh, how many years 2000, ago? 2015, so nine years ago. Nine years ago. So I, I would say, Lara, that uh, in the recent years, something changed. Uh, I don't know. Definitely. Probably thanks uh, to, to all <laughs> of you doing these uh, brave uh, actions, but also uh the the perception the culture the language probably the the word that i know now i see that uh, it's more welcoming probably to diverse way of uh um of, i think uh, that that the world is starting to to being bro broken in 2012 with thanks to the paralympic game in london uh, yeah. that changed the perspective at the social society, life, society level of the disability. Uh, I mean, the videos made for um, Power Olympics came by the, um, the British uh, television and the broadcasts. The was famous wonderful. superwoman, no? Yeah. Superhuman. Superhuman was, uh, was fantastic to break the wall and the barrier of prejudice. Uh, at the same time, so we have to continue this kind of work against stereotypes and prejudice because there are some uh, it doesn't exist a kind of disability we have many kind of disabilities and it means that we have to take care uh, one by one because for what concerns cp we have to highlight that it doesn't exist a sort of cp Every person with CP is different from what, from another. I am different from Agnes, and both we are different from other people with CP, because an injury to the brain is as different experts, person by person, and it is very very important to say that to the parents that is starting to consider their son or daughter as a person with CP. Uh, it's something um, impossible to live. Of course, it's difficult or better, it's different. The, um, before we spoke about a uh, teenager with CP, it's important to say I what I said to you, Francesca, some days ago here in Brussels. So uh, during my when I was a teen, it was very difficult to being a person with disability. But I broke my own wall when I I understood that my mother and me was into different world. 
live in different worlds. And I could not understand my mother because we live in different, in, in different worlds. Because being a person with disability means having different feelings and different relationships with the society that my mother could not understand, not because she, she could not try. She didn't want, fun, no. But because she, she didn't live. The feelings are different. And in, in that moment in which I, I understand this point, my life changed at all. And I felt much better with myself. With myself. I, I don't think, Laura, me. that uh, it's not so rare being a teenager deciding this type <laughs> of approach. I mean, uh, everyone at this age probably is trying to find uh, his own uh, route uh, in, in, in the world. So I think it's, it's uh, so much relevant uh, for those people who need to find uh, a space uh, which is not uh, so well recognized. So, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you also for sharing this message because uh, it's something uh, on which we, we want to educate people. No? We were just saying that uh, it's a matter of culture, it's a matter of sharing uh, the right words, the, the, the right uh, uh, way we want to other people uh, look at us. So uh, the, the core of our chat today was also around uh, technology. So I wanted to understand with you how do you think that technology had uh, helped you to overcome barriers? So we know that uh, uh, disability is a matter of context, uh, so how much the context can be uh, something that makes our life easier or uh, worse. Uh, so in this case, for example, making some example for in your own life uh, to communicate uh, with the people, to take care of yourself, so meaning uh, uh, doing uh, physical therapy or any other things that you do for your own healthcare or working or just uh, uh, do whatever you want to do, like sports or going to a theater or uh, just going and traveling. So I, I don't know say, once to start. Oh, go, Agnes, go, please. I must say I grew up uh, with technology very closely because when I was in fourth grade, I, I already used my laptop to, uh, to take notes in classes because I haven't been able to write by hand uh, so, legible, uh, so beautifully and legible than when I did when I, when I typed something. And was it common uh, uh, among other peers? No, other, no it, you no. were the only one at that time. Those, those weren't the times that are now. I was, uh, I was in my primary school in the 2000s, and these, these were the beginnings of digitalization and everything. So my case was pretty much uh, isolated. But that didn't um, represent any problem for me because I enjoyed it. I admit you were that proud some, of being here. Yeah, <laughs> I, I enjoyed using the computer because uh, <laughs> during uh, oral examinations of my classmates, for example, when teachers uh, were examining them, I uh, had the time to write my novel on laptop. So <laughs> I haven't done any schoolwork that we got for today, but instead I wrote my story and my poems and everything. So I, I, um, I what, really think... what kind of adaptation do you use, Agnes, when using the computer? For a computer, I don't use any, any special adaptation. Maybe... Um, you don't no, type or I, you just I just type speak? I type uh, really fast I'm a good typer and I I gained a lot of skill in that field but uh, recently I've started to use the AI um, voice recorder to convert the the text the sound to text because it it helps you with time and uh, you are more more efficient using this that's the same um, maybe, for me. Yeah? <laughs> when I send the, a vocal message, that, that's the same. So yeah, maybe. it's better. Uh, and especially, I sometimes I have a phone call anxiety. <laughs> and so um, that's something I battle with uh, for a long time, especially 
after COVID and all the quarantine and isolation. And uh, I, the voice recordings, voice notes are definitely the way to, you know, to have a little compromise <laughs> with phone calls. I'm, because, I'm this kind of person too. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. We but get, I, get I try, I try to get past this obstacle. So this isn't a permanent solution. I know that, but this it it is a way to um, to move forward in that field. You know, uh, and uh, maybe you know my job is connected with computer, of course. You can't, you cannot be translator and not using a computer. So these two goes hand in hand. And uh, this is another aspect that is interesting because uh, in college we started to use uh, computer assisted translation. This is, uh, these are specially designed tools, translation tools to uh, create your text, not in a Word document, but in the document uh, provided by these specific tools uh, and which can create a perfect copy of the final Word document because you convert it to the Word document in the at the end of the process. But these these tools are not uh, have not been tested yet for accessibility or I don't know maybe they were but I'm not just I'm just not aware of it um, and the texts and formats of these uh, these programs are very uh, small and I'm used to large format. I'm used to large text because I my vision is not very good for small uh, small scales and small formats and these this was the problem when I first started to use them and this is the reason why I don't like computer assisted translation. Uh, because it's not practical for me and it makes and probably process, it was yeah. not uh, at the time it was not uh, developed uh, using inclusive design or asking to, not, yeah. to beneficiaries although it started developing to yeah although it started develop in 2010 i think but they still haven't done a lot in terms of accessibility to different groups Maybe the situation has been changed now. <laughs> I should check for that. Uh, but yeah, so that was the example when the technology was not the best solution for me. Uh, other ex other cases, for example, of different apps like uh, IKEA apps. Uh, I delivered a speech on my experience with uh, satisfaction with IKEA products online. And it was a very nice experience. Mm, to you mean uh, ordering uh, online on their uh, yeah, e ordering, yeah, ordering, uh, comparing with the physical shops. So oh, what's, right. what's the difference between, yeah, what's the difference between the experience? And I would say such apps are very useful for us because we don't have to go to the actual physical store. But yeah. this also have a little mm, disadvantages of staying at home all the time. So we have to balance going out and staying home in that case. Uh, also different library systems like uh, to order books in a library so you can borrow or you can extend your uh, books. You Do keep you read uh, e-books or paper books? A uh, mix of everything. I read ebooks and paper books combined, a little, a little bit of both, because I cannot separate from the physical book still. Uh, but I like to read ebooks so that I stay on track with what is happening on the market. <laughs> So, yeah. Just to see um, if uh, that, that can be more flexible. For example, yeah, you can uh, um, underline or uh, get yeah. bigger text. And also when you, for example, learn a new vocabulary, there's another option that you, for example, yeah. uh, uh, mark new words and you look up in a dictionary what they mean. And this is another great way of using e-readers for that matter. Um, but other things like, for example, streaming, theater, shows, I prefer that live. I don't like streaming though so much, but I during COVID I used to watch a lot of streaming and online, for example, online shows 
in uh, theater, videos. So during COVID, technology was my way out because I couldn't go anywhere. And this is much difficult, much more difficult if you live in a countryside because you are even more isolated. Yeah, yeah, I I can get this point. Uh, I mean, uh, all of us experienced uh, during uh, COVID, uh, uh, but also nowadays. Uh, before we were mentioning uh, how hard is uh, getting to plan uh, uh, to travel because uh, you always need mm -hmm. to ask for an assistance uh, early in advance. Uh, for so example, probably also going to a theater or yeah. going to uh, watch a movie. Probably it's it's hard the same. It's uh, it's it's easier to stay at home, but it's a, a unique experience if you can go to the theater and to the cinema. But uh, in addition, about uh, what about educational process? For example, now that I'm in my PhD, I have a chance because of Teams to have my consultations with my professors and mentor online and I don't have to go to to the faculty for right. every every little thing that I need and this is something now that I don't have regular classes anymore this is something very great because you can stay at home um, but on the other hand I do miss my colleagues and social interactions so I like to have work from home like this is the base of my work and then I like to combine it with uh, live interactions and different social surroundings. So I have a mix of both. You Good. have you have the, you have the best of both worlds in in exactly that sense. exactly. Yeah. The, the important maybe is uh, just uh, getting to know both of them. So how to deal with both of them. So you yeah. you can choose uh, at this time. And Laura, what about you? Well, for me, I, I have the same problem timing, but I. At my age, I can say, so the beginning of 90, uh, when I started with my primary school, laptops didn't exist anymore, and computers were not so uh, so cheap than today. And so I did not have the possibility to, to type, so I learned to use, uh, to write by pen. So you had no chances at that no time? No chance. <laughs> Even if my father bought the first PC with the the green um, the green uh, screen, I don't know if you remind. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I cannot use that because it was not so easy to use for a, a child age of six. So it it was at home, but it stayed just in case of emergency. But I I've never used that. Um, I learned to, to write by fan, so I spent a lot of time learning write, to write because it was a really, really difficult and painful for me. Um, it was a matter of, of motor skills, so fine motor skills, or it's a matter of organization of the no, text, it's, of the no, space? No, no, it's, it's a question of motor skills and, and pains because of the, of the spasticity, because uh, just to explain what spasticity is, spasticity is the um, the ability to use the muscles, or or at, for nothing, or uh, at the top of your your ability. So and no, your no, not in so the middle. Have, or no, you zero have, one. Yeah, uh, you cannot uh, you cannot balance the force, and it means that you are tired very soon. Uh, and for for a, ch a child who is learning to write, it's not very practical because you you don't understand what is uh, what is um, uh, what happens to you, be, uh, the reason for your pains, and so you could think that writing is painful. Uh, so you could starting to avoid to write. Um, so you, you could have quit at that time. You could yeah, have. Uh, yeah. And for Grown that reason, people without learning how to write, be just because uh, the context was not accessible. Yeah, so, and coloring was was the same for me. And my mother told every time that when I was uh, a little bit older, 
I just wrote down the, num the, the name of the color. So red, blue, yellow, because it was the quickest way to color something. Not, not to paint. <laughs> <laughs> because, of course, painting with a, a short shirt was quite impossible to me. Uh, but my problem was um, what my CP seems. Because if you look at me, you don't look that my arms are spastic. Just if you are a doctor, you can test me and check that my spasticity is on my my arms too. But it doesn't it it it, it doesn't uh, mean that uh, I don't feel my spasticity. <laughs> so you're fully it, aware. Yeah, but it was very difficult for my teachers for all my studies understand what was my difficulties and and how uh, to help you. Um, the most difficult was to explain that I could not uh, do written uh, answers to the to the questions for what is considered an oral subject such as history or geography that my professor at the high school considered as oral subject. But for uh, to be shorter, uh, they um, wanted to, to to do in a written test. Uh, and uh, they pretend to me that I could answer 10 questions in one hour, that it was impossible to me because of my spasticity. And when I, uh, my parents and I tried to explain what was my problem, uh, they didn't understand nothing. If so, they thought that it was just a way to avoid you were the, lazy the task. Or you were trying yeah. to... <laughs> yeah not to the, do homeworks uh. <laughs> but i at the same time i i did scientific high school that italian knows but for everyone um it was uh, it, drawing is obligatory so i had techno technical drawing that it was quite impossible to me and it's, so at, it's a mess for it, every child with cp it, yeah? just just to let you know that it's the most frequent a question that we receive from parents so yeah. how to use the rule uh, with one hand yeah. with two hands that they are not but, working properly but I, I was the first generation uh, for students with disability in high school because the obligation after uh, 18 uh, years was up to my year so it means that high school was not able to um, to open mind to disabilities uh, but my professor uh, for uh, for uh, drawing was an excellent teacher that I be at the beginning he didn't understand understand nothing, but at the half of he the was year, open to learn. Yeah, yeah, at the half of the year, he called my parents and asked asking why I had ten on uh, ten over ten in the history of art and three or four over ten. And technical drawing. Drawing. <laughs> uh, my father tried to explain, but he didn't understand because it was out of mind. So um, my father said to him, don't worry. Uh, uh, look at Laura when, he, when she's drawing and uh, you will understand everything. So at the beginning, I was so scared about that because uh, I was convinced that it was like the other teachers that didn't want to learn something new. Uh, on the contrary, he, he obliged my classmate to move to another bank to, to sit beside uh, me just to look at me for one week. And I was so ashamed about myself because I thought that I had something wrong. But after so everyone week, was looking at you, everyone was looking at me. <laughs> drawing wh while the rest of the class did everything else than drawing so as everyone um so he's at the mo at, the, at that moment he started to give me six over ten at least because he started to say to to, to think and to say um the six over ten so that the the 
the the basis of the the, the good mark is just because you try to do your yeah. best yeah then he arrives to give me up to nine over ten because not because it was like a nine over ten of my classmates no, because the trend from uh, Be because the i learned something yeah, yeah and my effort you know. was was good but um, Laura, do you think that uh, at your time, if you probably had had the right adaptation or a speech to text, uh, to write and, and to draw, could have been uh, different? I don't know, because because I think that everything is linked to the, the ability to be open mind to the teachers. So if you find a teacher that is not open mind, is very close and doesn't want to adapt uh is didactic to your needs it's impossible to to have a normal relationship because but, but, but be by always... principle now uh we should put all the pupils at the same level in order to let them learn uh, everyone at its, its own pace uh, so uh, yeah, now yeah, i think that it's uh it's, yeah. You, you have um, common, yeah. people with dyslexia, people uh, uh, with um, impairment uh, on the eyes, uh, deaf people, uh, you could have anything uh, you have that to can say, imply. I think that teachers have, have to start to consider every pupil uh, as a person with special needs, because every one of us has something different than each other. So, I mean, uh, and now probably was... you you realize also with your son oh yeah without a disability you realize that it's different yeah. from any other son yeah but my father my father also uh, always told to me that i have a visible disability so the people approach to me as a person who has a problem but in the society every one of us has a sort of disability and it's not it's possible that invisible disability is much much uh, worse than a disability that you can see yeah if you if we go back to the assistive technology field let, let me uh, share with uh, people who will be listening to us that both of you are sitting in the boards of the European Cerebral Palsy Association and both of you uh, contributed to write uh, the manifesto for cerebral palsy and one point over there is specific on uh, assistive technology. So my last question to both of you would be on this, uh, how, how would you aim uh, in, in the next future? So the next uh, Laura and Agnes that uh, will be born in uh, 2014, uh, how, how, what, what do you hope for them uh, in terms of uh, assistive technology? I hope children uh, will have devices and means of making their life easier and that each uh, technology that develops in the future will be designed according to their needs that it won't be easier to use and, and, and uh, together with them uh, starting yeah, with them starting to and together with them yeah that it will be uh, i will i will use an overly used word user friendly but the emphasis is on friendly the technology has to be friendly indeed in order for people to even motivate them to learn how to use it especially in the case of children and even older people. Even older people have problems exactly. adapting to technology. And I think that um, developers should uh, catch the right pace to move together with the rest of the people. But at the same time, I hope that it will not be the case that technology will enslave us so that we will have a chance to choose when to use technology and why and when to use the old-fashioned ways so that freedom of choice will be taken into consideration in all, all aspects of modern development in every field of technology i i, I 
fully agree with you, Agnes. I like a lot the concept of inclusive design. So the fact that we could start co-designing, uh, starting from the needs of the beneficiaries that could be people with uh, a permanent uh, disability or a temporary disability or someone like uh, an, an occasional disability, if, like for example, a mother who is holding a baby and needs to push the stroller is the same yeah. Like a person with a uh, hemiplegia, probably. And also, what is the important is lifespan of the of devices, <laughs> because if device is broken too too early, then it's problem with uh, financial aspects and money and everything that goes with it. So, uh, people should improve of on the quality of their items, not just quantity, but quality. <laughs> Yes, I also like this point because uh, it reminds us that uh, uh, assistive technology is not always given for free in every country. It's something that costs a lot, so it needs to <laughs> last a lot. <laughs> it needs to serve. It needs to serve good to the people yeah. who use right. it. Laura, well, I I hope for next generations that will be able to to have a social life. I mean that it, it will be possible to attend, um, and to go wherever, whatever, and whenever we want. So steep trails are just a reminder for the old people as us <laughs> that um, are living in, in a world with a, with, without ramps. So I would, I would like for the next generation that our fight for freedom will be over and it was something that they could study on the history book. I, I also agree on this. I just experienced uh, with you in the last days how hard <laughs> it's find. It's, it's to find is how hard it is to find uh, an accessible toilet, which something that probably is given for granted or should be given for granted to everyone. So I also like the fact that uh, both of you underline the word uh, uh, freedom. No? It's something that uh, probably we, we should fight uh, by principle for, for it. So we should aim for everyone to have the freedom of, of choice for, for everything. So, and I think, yeah, and I think we, we are witness of some historic movement in the field of accessibility and also in the field of independent living because uh, right now I think the history is being written. So yeah, there's a great progress that, it, that awaits us in the future. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, sincerely, because uh, you are a, a role model for our community. So I, I do hope that also people that will look at this interview during the War CP Day will, uh, will learn something more. And so we'll learn to build up a more accessible world in which everyone has this freedom of choice. So thank you again. Thank, thank you for you. the invitation and bye everyone. Bye, Ciao. everyone. Ciao. Ciao.